I've been asked today to give a, a testimony uh, before the tithes and offering, and it uh, and it's my testimony, and it started back in 2010 when I actually walked away from a great job because I couldn't handle uh, the principalities that I was being attacked with and not understanding why I was being attacked. So I left a great job uh, in 2010, in June of 2010. Actually, my last, you know, I know the dates, my last my last date of appointment was Memorial Day. Uh, not Memorial Day, yeah, um, of 2010. So between 2010 and 2014, I had four different jobs. Uh, and I can safe to say that two of them I didn't like, but I had no choice because I had to put food on the table and pay the mortgage. Uh, so I went about my way for four years, um, but during that time, it was a test of faith. Not only was it a test of faith, it was a test of obedience on where I was at and where I wanted to go. So I was unemployed probably during those four years, probably for a period of about six weeks, but yet I still tithe. Uh, when I left my great job, I took a 28% decrease in pay. So basically, fundamentally, we had to say, okay, we had to buckle down, we had to budget. But yet, when I budgeted, my tithing was still there. The tithing was the first check I wrote every week and will continue to write every week until I'm gone. Uh, <clears throat> so the story gets even better. So for four years, it was just a, a, a complete test of faith. Uh, the last company I worked for in 14, from January to April 14, uh, the owner came up to me and says, look, hey, we're gonna shut it down because he took another position in Dallas and wasn't able to be here with me as, as I ran his business. So basically it gave me about six weeks to find a new job. Well, by the grace of God, I've Sent my resume out on a Friday, got a call on a Saturday, interviewed on a Monday, took a job on Tuesday. So that's how great it was. Uh, the biggest uh, miracle, is several miracles, is that when I took the new job, I got a 31% increase in pay. So it took four years to manifest up to that point. So then I went to work for this one company and after being there for about two pay periods, he came up to me and says, hey, can you cash my check on Monday? And this was Friday. And the agreement was like get paid every other Friday. And that was the sign. Okay, I need to start looking for another job. So that weekend, I got a call from a friend of mine asked me if I was still looking for a job, and I said yes. So then that process took about two months. So once I got that job, uh, once, once we went through the process of interviewing and all the drug tests and everything, background check, I took that job, and I started on that job in July of 2014. With that job, I got another 24% increase in pay, and that was just that was just me being loyal and obedient and tight. And I remember pulling up into my driveway when I got the first check after I got the first increase. And I just said, and I told myself, I don't know why I did it. And the Lord said, it wasn't you, it was me. That's right. So I said, well, thank you. So, and, <laughs> and ever since then, it's been great. Um, so I worked for them for this company from 14 to 16, went back to another company I used to work for, the one that I left, because they wanted me to come back. Didn't really take any more money any less, stayed the same because uh, the company I was working, I left, was slowing down. So then that was great. Uh, I had the weekends off, so it was really, really a blessed two years. So then in 2018, I get a call from the people I used to work for from 14 to 16, and they wanted to talk to me about coming back. I said, okay, well, let's just, you know, when you're ready, call me. Uh, but prior to that phone call I got, the Holy Spirit said to me in March, he says, you will work for this company. And I said, okay. And then about three months later, I get the phone call. So at the end of the day, uh, that's where I'm at today. But I can say from 2010 till today, I've had an increase of about 60% of my pay, which is great. I mean, and that's just, and it's like he said it wasn't me, it was him. And I continue to tithe my offerings 
or actually my tithes, but also give offerings extra to as well. I mean, that's that's the key. Our, our money that we receive here for the church is for our sanctuary, but yes, we support other, other organizations around us. That's who we are. Except the song that's who we are. Uh, so we, I can't tell you how much the importance is of tithing. It should be in your regular budget and for your house, for your car, for the church. Because if we give, we receive. And everybody wants to receive. So if you don't give, you don't get, you really can't be mad at anybody. So you have to dig down deep and uh, and just do your fair share of tithing. So it, it's it's great. And it's, I think, be not afraid is 365 times in the, in the Bible. So don't be afraid. You know, get out of your comfort zone. Yeah, it might, you might not go out for dinner twice a month, just once a month, but that extra money goes a long way for our sanctuary and our church and the people here. Okay? So with that, I'd just like to say, my, my favorite scripture is Malachi 3.10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. So, be, be obedient, be faithful. And, and do not be afraid. And that's the whole key. Don't be afraid. With that, you can lift up your tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you for today, Father. We thank you that we are able, Father, to, to tithe and offer, Father, to your sanctuary here and everywhere, Father. Father, let, let your blessings be upon us, Father. Let your grace and mercy fall us wherever we go, Father. For, Father, we thank you for the roof over our head, the foundation under our feet, Father, the, the doors and the windows and the sides of our house, Father, our car, our job, Father, our health, Father. Father, for we thank you for everything that we have, Father. Father, we thank you again, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, everyone. Today is an amazing day, Amen. and it's awesome to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's awesome. Yes, one yes. clap. <laughs> and get excited. Rejoice this morning. You know, I'm truly blessed this morning because I have my father here with me. And I was so surprised this morning. He called to... to um, you know, see how we were doing, and, and he asked about church, and he said he was he was getting ready. If I could go pick him up, he wanted to come. And you know, just a little background on my on my father, and I, I shared this uh, a few months back um, that only by prayer and the grace of God is my father sitting in this sanctuary this morning. Um, you know, he he got really sick a few months back that we really didn't think he was going to make it. We were preparing ourselves for him to not make it. That's how bad the situation looked. And no, it was not coronavirus. It, it was a different uh, illness, that, an underlying illness that he has. But prayer, prayer moves mountains. Amen. And, you know, it was... Uh, we we had a good, we went and saw him my, my siblings and I and we had to see him through a window because they wouldn't allow us in and that was hard that was very hard and you know my sister uh, decided to get everyone together to pray at a certain time you know some of our family members and and so we did and I tell you what like fat instantaneously he started doing better from prayer from coming together in agreement and so he's 76 years old 76 years old with an underlying condition and he's sitting here in church Amen. even with an oxygen tank it's in a car but uh, and mask and all you know and it just it, I'm so, my heart is just, just going all over the place because this is what it's about. It's about others, you know, and uh, some, some, you know, people may say, oh, well, I'm not going to church if I have to wear a mask. Well, first you were complaining because the church wasn't open 
and now it's open. But you're complaining because you have to wear a mask. Newsflash, some of you wore a mask before the pandemic to church. Ooh, ouch. Yeah. We tell it like it is here. I mean, you know, seriously, come on, people. If, if it takes me wearing a mask and, and asking for my father to sit in this sanctuary to hear the word of God, then we will do it. Anyway, that's not my message, but let's get going. You know, I want, to, I want to tell you today that it's time. It is time to wake up those dry bones. We've been in a dry season for way too long. I know many of us have been in the valley lately. I think we've all have been there at one point during this whole pandemic thing going on. And you may be feeling a change in your Christian walk. Something like the joy that you once had is diminishing. There are more pressures on you now than ever before. Your marriage may not be doing so well. You may be on the verge of just giving up. Your prayer life is not what it used to be and you're not going to church anymore. And do you know that your individual walks, walk affects the church as a whole? The church has been affected in these last few months because individuals are gradually dying spiritually. Satan, or you can say the coronavirus, is sucking the life right out of God's people. It's gripping them with fear. That, that fervor, that fire that you once had for Jesus has been extinguished. I mean, completely. Look at the valley of the dry bones. There was nothing left but bones. There was no nothing. And some of you, the fire has completely been, been extinguished. But today... We ignite. Amen. Today, we get that spark again. Amen? Amen? So today's message is to encourage you individually that God will breathe new life into you so that you in turn bring the church to life again and be that great army that he called you to be. So I want to tell you this morning, to let there be some rattling in your valley today. We're going to start with Ezekiel 37, which talks about the prophet Ezekiel in the valley of the dry bones. And we'll start with verse 1, which says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. The valley of dry bones represented the nations of Israel. But it speaks spiritually of the church today. You see, a valley will represent trials of life that you're going through right now. The low, dark days of hardship. But what does Psalm 23, 4 through 6 say? And I'm reading out of the, the uh, New King James Version. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now I want to tell you. Gabriel, can you bring me that, that rod? There's six things about the valley that you're in. That God said in these verses. There's six things that God said about this valley. First of all, he said... 
Yea, though I walk. You're walking through it. You don't set up camp in the valley. You walk through it. The second thing, you don't have to be afraid because God is with you. Didn't we just read that? I will fear no evil. Not, well, I may fear the coronavirus, but I won't fear anything else. No, no. Coronavirus is evil. We're not to fear it because God is with us. The third thing, his rod and staff comfort you. You see, this rod here is called, uh, the Hebrew name is Mata. And it represents authority. So his authority, you know, some say that it's also called a staff, a rod. But he says in scripture, your rod and staff. To me, those are two separate things. So the rod represents the authority and the staff, which has the hook on it, is guiding. Because that's what the shepherds use to guide their sheep back into the pasture. So both the rod, the authority, oh, I love this. The rod is because he's standing in between us and our enemies saying, I have the authority. You cannot touch my people. And the staff, because he's guiding us back to where we need to be. Amen? Amen. Woo, Jesus. The fourth thing, God causes you to triumph in spite of your enemies. Didn't he say he's going to prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies? Number five, God anoints you to go through the valley. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. And the sixth thing, goodness and mercy are following you through the valley. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's what scripture says. So that means even in the valley, goodness and mercy will follow Woo, get excited, people. We serve a mighty God. The enemy wants to dry up your joy in the valley, in those low places. Think about it. Who's full of joy when your finances are lacking? Who's jumping up for joy when you don't know where your next meal is coming from or how you're going to pay your light bill? Or Who's jumping up for joy when your marriage is in trouble? Who's jumping up for joy when you've lost your job? Think about it. But also remember this. Scripture says in Nehemiah 8.10 that the joy of the Lord is my strength. So let's go to verse 2 of Ezekiel 37. And he says, then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. He didn't just say they were dry. They were very dry. What that meant is that they had been there a long, long time. See, the bones represent anything that seems dead in your life your spiritual life. So Ezekiel saw them and said, these bones are very dry. In the natural eye, you're thinking, well, there, there's no hope for these bones. You know, they've been there a long time. Don't let the devil dry you up. You see, Israel at one time was a great and vibrant nation, but what happened? They allowed wickedness to come in. Their lack of faith in God caused them to gradually die and be drawn away from God. Hmm. Isn't that what's happening today? We're being gradually drawn away from God. I heard a, a pastor say that the Lord told him as the virus intensifies, more people will draw away from God. Why? 
It's time to draw nearer to God. It's time to run towards God, not run and turn away from Him. The Lord sees His children with no joy, no direction, no fruit in their lives. And some play in church, just like I said earlier about the mask. Some people have been wearing that mask since before they were ordered to wear it in church. You know, they're going through the motions of church with no real transformation. How sad must that make God? These are his children. Imagine your own children. They're not, they're, there's no joy in them. They're just going through the, through, through the motions, no direction, you know? Doesn't that make you sad? Same thing with God. We're his beloved. Verse 3. And he, the Lord, said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. In other words, God, you know the answer to that question. You know, but I love that he gave him reverence. He called him Lord and God. That's who he is. But he says, you know. Why? Because nothing is impossible with our God. You know, he was telling them, if you choose for them to, to live, then they will. But if Ezekiel had responded in his own human reasoning, like some of us probably would, he probably would have said something like, what? Are you kidding me? Have you seen what they look like? They're very dry. No, they can't live. What's wrong with you? You know, that, that's what some of us would have said. But Ezekiel, he didn't underestimate the power of God. He knew that no matter how hopeless and lifeless the graveyard appeared, God could bring them back to life. You see, nothing is too hard for our God. Remember, Jesus said, with men, it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. So get out of your doubt and step into your faith. You have to do something about the dead bones in your life. Verse 4 says, Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. God's word is so powerful that it infuses new life to that which is dead. Isn't that amazing? His word is that powerful. Whenever the Lord speaks, things happen. Especially if we look at Mark, the first chapter of Mark, when Christ said to the leper, be cleansed. And immediately, the leper was cleansed. Right? Yes. That's all he had to say, be cleansed. That was a command. He wasn't saying, oh, well, let's see. I, I pray maybe if it's God's will, he'll heal you. No, no. He said it with authority and power. He said, be cleansed. And the leper was cleansed. In John 5, Jesus told the man who had not walked in 38 years to get up and walk. Why aren't we doing that today? Why aren't we using the authority and the power that's been given to us? To heal the sick. You know, I said last week how before the pandemic, we people would come into church to get prayed for healing. This is a house of prayer. And now people are staying out of church for fear of getting sick. 
What has changed? Has this stopped being a house of prayer? No, it has not. Verse five, five through six. Verses five through six. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. You see, God can take someone that's grown weary in doing good, discouraged with life or church, and restore their spiritual passion for Christ, their love for others, their commitment to the church and the gospel. God can do that. Verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, a suddenly rattling noise, and the bones came together, bone to bone. You know, as I was, I was doing my, my study, I was thinking bone to bone, I started thinking, I don't know why it came to my mind, think about the skeleton song, y'all remember that? The foot bones connected to the leg bone. The legs bone connected. <laughs> yeah, pastor's crazy. I know. It just it got me thinking. I'm thinking that you know when you think about the bones coming together, but they came together in perfect order. So you know that's it was fitting. So you think about the body coming together the body the body of Christ the church I'm not just talking about this church the churches coming together we make up the body of Christ this is revival starting to take place Ooh, I hope y'all are getting excited out there because verse 8 Indeed, as I looked, the sinews, which means the tendons and the veins, and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over. But there was no breath in them. Notice how God was doing things in order. The tendons had to go in first, the veins, and then the flesh, and then the skin. It would have been crazy if he'd have put the skin on first and then the tendons and the veins. It would have been a hot mess. But he, did, he does things in order. God always works through a process and does things in their proper order. Whether it's rebuilding his church or rebuilding us individually. Reviving us. 1 Corinthians 4 says, says, Let all things be done decently and in order. Do you know that there's an order to our maturity in Christ as well? We find that in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. And I'm reading out of the Passion Translation. And it says, So devote yourselves to lavishly supplementing your faith with goodness. And to goodness add understanding. And to understanding, add the strength of self-control. And to self-control, add patient endurance. And to patient endurance, add godliness. And to godliness, add mercy toward your brothers and sisters. And to mercy toward others, add unending love. That's order of spiritual maturity. So at this point, all the body parts were in their proper place, but there was still no life in these bodies. So Ezekiel is surrounded by 
cold, dead bodies. Cold, dead bodies do nothing. They just lay there. Verse 9 says, Also he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. The word breath here in Hebrew is the same word translated spirit or ruach. So Ezekiel speaking to the breath is a symbol of praying to the Spirit of God, to Holy Spirit. So to come alive, we need Holy Spirit in us. And if we allow God's Holy Spirit to breathe new life into us, there is nothing that Revelation Glory Church or other churches in this area cannot do in and for this community. Amen. Verse 10 says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. They came alive and they stood. Now, they, it didn't say they came alive and they laid there. It didn't say they came alive and they just sat there. They stood. You see, you can't fight while you're laying down. You can't fight while you're sitting down, much less sitting watching TV. You can't fight like that. You have to stand. And then he said, a weak, unstable army? Is that what scripture said? No. He said an exceedingly great army their graveyard became their battleground God gave them life to fight our spiritual lives come alive so we can become soldiers in God's army you see it is now recruiting time. Are you ready? Are you ready to be recruited into God's army? Yes. Your anointing is for the battle. If you're saying no to enlisting, then you're saying yes to stagnation, which becomes bondage. You're saying, no, I'm not going to enlist in God's army. I don't want to move. Hmm. Isn't that what stagnation is? Stagnant water is water that stops flowing. And you get just nastiness on it. You know, insects, mosquitoes breed on that. They carry diseases. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get stagnant. And if you look at things, it seems at times like that's where the church is right now. Just stagnant. And I don't mean just this church. I mean it, the church in general. Just stagnant. It's not flowing. Holy Spirit has stopped flowing. And guess what? An environmental hazard has occurred. 
Like I said earlier, God's people have been gripped by fear of this virus instead of fear of God. And what they've done in that is they've relinquished their authority and power that's been given to them through Christ Jesus. They just handed it over to the enemy. And they said, oh no, you have more power than me. What, what is that? Today we take it back. We take back that authority and that power that was given to us. You know, they've lost the fire for God. The joy of the Lord is gone. And I truly believe that this virus has made Christians sleeping saints. Mm. I don't get no very many amens on that, but that's the truth. It has made them comfortable. It's time to get uncomfortable, just like our worship director said earlier. It's time to get uncomfortable. We've been comfortable too long. Yeah. Oh, I'll stay in my I'll stay in my bed in my jammies. I'll just watch it online. Yeah. Hey, that's all good and dandy. But you're gonna have to get to church sometime. If you're an army, an army cannot train <laughs> online or distant from each other. How do you become a great army unless you're together, training together? Oh, Jesus. I don't believe Ezekiel was comfortable in that valley full of dry bones. Some scholars say he was ankle deep in them. How would you like to be ankle deep in a valley full of dry bones? But it was in the getting uncomfortable that he saw the greatness of God. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying throw caution to the wind. Like I said, look, we're wearing masks here in church. But I am saying throw the fear the enemy has placed on you out. And take your rightful place in God's kingdom. Take it back. You know, you hear people say, well, the, the, the church, the, the building is not the church. No, we are the church. We are the church. We make up the church. But we need a place to gather, to assemble. To train. I mean, the army, you know, soldiers have a place to go to train, to assemble. It's, it's, you know, it's the same thing. An army assembles together and it's, it's time for battle assembly to take place. And what I mean by that, that's a term used by the U.S. Army Reserves. To describe training where soldiers practice and perfect their military skills and maintain individual and unit readiness in the event that they have to be deployed. Wow. Battle assembly. They have to come together to prepare as a unit. Right? Hmm. I hope y'all are getting something out of this. As a church, God can revive us and make us an army that will be part of his end time remnant. You see, he wants to raise up an army of spirit-filled people who will expand his kingdom. So our focus should be on what? More souls being saved. Stronger fellowship, a greater zeal or enthusiasm for the Lord and the church, and more people being involved in ministry. So what can you do individually to continue to flow and to grow? I like that when the Lord gave me that. I said, oh Lord, that's good. <laughs> 
He didn't tell me like that, but I had to add that little. Look, it's fun in the Lord. You know, it's, it's so much joy to be in the house of God and just to be in God. So what can you do individually? And with each one of these, there's scripture that goes behind it. So you can just write those down. Have faith in the power of God. That's Mark 9, 23. Get in the word of God. 1 Peter 2.2. 2. I just said there's power in his word. Why won't you get in the word of God? Be committed to the work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15.58. Respect and support your spiritual leaders. 1 Thessalonians 5.12-13. Give generously to kingdom work. 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Encourage one another. Hebrews 3, 13. Pray. James 5, 16. Pray. You see, God is looking for people who will stand up and prophesy to that which is dead and command it to come back to life. That's who God is looking for. You know, if there's power in the word and we are to be his mouthpiece, doesn't that mean that when we speak his word with his power, we can command and it will be done? Mm. God wants to hear your voice of faith. Not doubt in the valley. As you continue to speak the word, ooh, you'll begin to hear some rattling in the valley. So don't give up in the valley. Don't give up on your dead bones. This is not a wake up call. This is a rattle up call. Allow God to breathe his Ruach breath into you so you can come alive, arise, Amen. and accomplish all that he has for you. Amen. 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 Woo, Jesus, we thank you, Lord. So I'll just pray a, a blessing over you. So, Father God, we thank you, Jesus. For all those that were here, Father God, all those watching online, Lord Jesus, Father, we ask, Lord, that you ignite, reignite that fire within them, Lord Jesus. Breathe your Ruach breath into them that they may come to life, Father God. That they may accomplish and do what you've called them to do, Lord. We thank you that even though we're in, we may be in the valley, Father God, we're just walking through it, Lord, but you're with us. We thank you. We're taking back today that authority and the power that the enemy has taken. And we say we walk in faith and not fear. Our faith trumps any fear. So, Father, we thank you, Jesus, that we come together. We get ready together as a unit, Father God, to be your great army. Father, we're better together than we are apart. I thank you that you cover each and every person with your blood, Lord Jesus. Your blood that protects, that heals, that redeems. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. You are the great I am. You are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And we thank you for who you are, for what you're doing in this place and in this community, Father God. We thank you for fire to fall upon your people once again. We thank you that there's breakthrough in this community taking place right now in the name of Jesus. We declare it. We decree it in Jesus' name. We thank you for unity. 
in the, in the body of Christ. We honor you and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.